p.m. Uh, KDA uh, business meeting uh, for April 21st, 2020. Uh, first order is to approve the agenda. Scully approve. McBride second. Okay, any discussion? Uh, if not, I'll ask for the vote. Oh. Uh, Commissioner McBride? Aye. Commissioner Sawyer? Aye. Commissioner Pavlik? Aye. Commissioner Eady? Aye. I'll vote yes. Agenda passes 5 0. Uh, number two, approved minutes from the January 28, 2020 meeting. Go ahead, Bruce. Hey, Brad, second. Brad, second, okay. Any changes or updates to the meeting list? If so, I'll ask a question. All those in favor, Commissioner McBride? Aye. Commissioner Scoy? Aye. Commissioner Pavlik? Aye. Commissioner Eady? Aye. Um, yes. A minute's approved, 5 0. Uh, number three? Yes. Excuse me, please. I'm sorry. I missed the second on that. I had a first by Scoy uh, and a second by, I think there were two. <laughs> Aye. Does Commissioner McBride second? Okay. I, uh, I, yeah, I'm good though. Okay. All right. Thank you. And uh, the item is the approved the January to March paid invoice and vendor report. Well, looks like we had some uh, allocations and stuff there, Jen. That's right. We had our first tap allocations to the small cities. Um, the only other items that were on there was the Heart of the Continent uh, partnership for $250. And then we also had uh, the annual insurance Minnesota County's intergovernment of 1142 For um, And then the other one was to the St. Louis County Auditor. That's for twenty thousand three hundred and twelve dollars and fifty, and that was for the uh, joint uh, Voyagers National Park uh, joint powers. Uh, so total disbursements out of the fund were one hundred and ten thousand two hundred and four dollars and fifty cents. Thank you, Jen. All approved, Mr. Chair. Commissioner Eady makes a motion. Do I have a second? Second. <laughs> the Commissioner Pavlik? Yes. I'll ask for the question all those in favor. Uh, Commissioner McBride? Aye. Uh, Commissioner Slate? Aye. Commissioner Pavlik? Pavlik, aye. Uh, Commissioner Eady? Yeah. I'm going to and the invoice report passes 5-0. Uh, fourth item is the approved uh, January through March financial report. Uh, Jen, do you want to forward it? Sure. Thanks. So, Mr. Chair, when we started the year, uh, the ending balance for 12-31-2019 uh, was 303588 or $588. Um, we have had some year-to-date expenditures, with, uh, so that leaves the remaining fund balance of 193384 We do assign the remaining of those funds, um, of the remaining budget of 82000 There is an error on your uh, fund balance report. It was a mathematical uh, error. That number should have been subtracted, so... Um, the unassigned fund balance at this point is 110,992, but um, that will increase once we receive the IRRR 
the funding that we usually get in the fall. So um, everything looks good here. Um, we don't um, have any uh, with, in, unless you have any questions. So there's a, a question on what's on the agenda? Yes, the unassigned fund balance should have been subtracted instead of added. So the unassigned fund balance, instead of the 275000 it's actually 110992 But that number is going to change and go up all year long as we have expenditures. So it's not a super relevant number. Okay, so you, you want a motion with a correction or not? Yeah, I, that would be good. Motion with the credit. I'll make that clear. Okay, I'll move to the credit. Thank you, Kevin. Commissioner yep. Eden, correction. Commissioner McBride, second. McBride, second. Uh, any questions or anything else? If not, I'll ask for the vote. Uh, all those in favor, Commissioner McBride? Aye. Commissioner Scoy? Aye. Commissioner Bell. Aye. Commissioner Eady. Aye. And I. And, uh, Mr. Shreveport. It's 5-0. Uh, this is Kuching Technology Initiative 21 funding request. Um, is there anybody from KTI on the line? No one? Well, I'll speak a little bit to it. Uh, being a member of the committee, um, this is kind of for looking, at, looking ahead to next year and kind of getting kind of in the infancy stage here, of maybe getting some uh, bylaws adopted. Uh, I think at least like, uh, formed and started uh, prior to, to my being involved uh, with a group of great people. Uh, they're doing great work. Uh, they're reaching out. To they're, they're branching out into many different technology areas in our community and doing a lot of good, um, I think. And uh, they're instrumental in, in, in helping the, uh, the awarded uh, broadband fund uh, or broadband grants here uh, that was awarded to Paul Bunny. You know, they did a lot of legwork and groundwork on that to get that and make that happen. Uh, and uh, I, I think that in the future, uh, you know, I, I really, I really feel it's a, it's a good, uh, it's a good, a good group, and uh, you know, I think they're going to do a lot of good for our, for our area. Um, they, like I say, you know, they, they're far and wide, and one into the other. So, well, I think there's no one there uh, from the group to speak on that. So we can do. Can... Mr. Chair, this is Jackie. Hi, Jackie. Hi. I just want to reiterate what you stated. Um, like you, I joined KTI after it was formed, uh, and I would support any funding that is possible for this organization. They are a group of volunteers that work very hard, um, and they are trying to become more structured, but the big hurdle for them is a lack of funding in order to become structure. Uh, I feel that they bring great benefit to the Kuchichin community. Um, and I was part of the meeting where we discussed this proposed um, budget and bring it to KDA, and I just want to voice my support for it. Thank you, Jack. <clears throat> what, uh, what are they requesting? Uh, tentatively, I just have a very fluid budget here uh, of 15000 and you know, all don't have that here. Uh, that that's kind of we can maybe revisit it again in, in the July, at the July KDA meeting as well. So um, we're just kind of working on looking at some bylaws uh, stuff right now and kind of going through that process. So, Commissioner Sheldon, yes, uh, Commissioner McBride, uh, the fifteen thousand for this budget year is going to be a request for for next year, and then my other comment would be. You know, with what's going on in the country right now with, uh, you know, with COVID-19, and you just see how we are conducting our meetings, uh, reliable 
service, broadband service throughout the country and the state is so important. So I definitely, you know, thank those people for what you're doing and support it. Thank you, Commissioner McBride. So is, is that for this budget year? That, that would be for the 2021 budget year. Okay. I'll second that, Mr. Chair. I didn't think I made a motion. Yeah, we, 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 we can we can revisit it and stuff, and we, when we get we can get the information out to you maybe for the July meeting if that would work for everybody too. Then you can actually have a you can actually have a budget in hand. We have one here. It's just real it's real kind of loose, uh, you know, loosely written and stuff. And like I say, we're we're looking at some body laws and stuff right now. So if uh, if we could hold off, but we do. Uh, I know they they appreciate the support. So. I guess you said you supported us, so that's why I thought you made a motion. So, if you like, I'll make the motion, though. <laughs> uh, it, yeah, it, it's 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 uh, it, it, if you if you like, that's fine. If we can get a second, that's great. Uh, if not, we can table it too. That's okay too. So, whatever you like. I mean, you know, excuse me, there, Mr. Chair, but we seem that the. I mean, if the clerk were to take position, it should be to refer it to the budget for next year, not start making budget allocations here. Yes. You know, eight or nine months before the year is there. I mean, that doesn't make sense to me. No, no, no. No, hence the July meeting. We'll maybe get some more information to everybody if that works. So. I'll, I'll with my motion, Mr. Chair. And Mr. Chair, uh, my. My support was only a verbal support for what they're doing. It wasn't a support for for budget. I know we, you know, we'll we'll go you know, come August September time. So Okay. Is there any public comment? Hearing none, uh, I'll ask for a motion to adjourn. All right, move. Okay. Commissioner, Commissioner Pavlik, second? Oh, 80. 80%. Although, uh, I'll ask for the call. Uh, all those in favor, Commissioner McBride? Aye. Was there an addition to the agenda on the ramps? That's for the right Oh, oops, hold it. Uh, um, okay, COVID-19 
looking up there. I was looking at the ADA agenda, so. <laughs> Uh, good morning. Morning. The um, latest statistics for COVID-19 in Minnesota are 2,470 confirmed, 143 deaths, and 1,202 recovered. We have not reached our peak yet. The numbers do continue to climb each day. As far as the operations of um, community services and public health, we're continuing continuing to operate with uh, the social distancing rules and the close to the public, with most folks working remotely, and that is going well. There is nothing new to report on any of that. Yes, yes, that will always remain. Um, it is listed now as a cumulative case yeah. because that person has recovered. Yeah. I was just asking if there was any increases, basically, so. Not, there's no increases locally. Okay, yep. Any other questions for, for Kathy? Commissioner Eighty, this is Commissioner McBride. Uh-huh. Kathy, one quick question, and I know it's very difficult, and that is, we keep hearing the testing, testing, and and I guess I'm confused, uh, you know, when this comes forward, though, who are we testing and when are we testing? That, you know, I just don't understand how you can test somebody and say they're okay, and then two days later they come in contact. And, you know, I just, I'm really struggling with how this testing is going to be done and really what good it's going to do. The, well, the testing, the testing right now, there's priorities, uh, priority testing. So anyone who exhibits the symptoms, which is, are the sore throat, fever, uh, coughing, they will be tested. Then if they be, are positive, anybody that they have come into contact with that may show some symptoms or even, you know, maybe asymptomatic, they may choose to test those people as well. What's really going to help, I believe, in the future is to, to be able to test for the antibodies to see who has already had it and who hasn't, and whether those antibodies are present. That will be really key to opening up the public again. As I think as more tests become available, which there still is a shortage of tests with the reagents and um, all of the different parts of the tests, so they have to keep those tests um, to use them very conservatively. Should we get more test test kits available, they would be able to test more of the general public to see, you know, who has it, who doesn't. There may be people who have been asymptomatic that now have antibodies. Um, so they're just they just enforce the guidelines on who to be tested because of the uh, lack of testing kits. Does that answer your question, Brian? Yeah, yeah. but my, my problem is that, you know, as, as we move forward and, and people and the economy, uh, you know, and this small businesses and, and all businesses, I mean, it, to me, it looks like this testing is going to be, it's going to take six, eight, maybe a year before we get to the point where we can start testing everybody in general population. We're not going to have a state left if we got to wait for all that. That's why the um, testing for the antibodies is so important. That's just a uh, quick prick of the finger and a little bit of blood taken. And if that gets approved and is widely distributed, that's really more of the key than the actual test kits for determining whether someone um, currently has the COVID. They'll, they'll work together, both both kinds of testing, but the antibody test is really important. And that's going to be able to be developed um, much quicker and more readily available, I think, than the other test kits. That's not approved right now, Kathy? I don't know exactly where that's at right now. I've, I've watched some videos and read some information about that they were you know, testing it with people, but I don't know if it's wi widely available yet. 
about the, the basic test? Is there, is there some of those available in Coos County right now? Yes, we do have we do have test kits to use um, and are following the guidelines for using those tests. And and where does the person go if they need one? They can go to either the clinics. Um, Dr. Caperna is also doing testing. I I understand. Um, they will be screened if someone calls and wants to have a test. They will be screened to see if they meet the criteria for the testing. Um, and if they do, they would then they would be administered a test. Okay. Anybody else have anything for Kathy? Okay, thank you. Uh, approved minutes of April 14th, regular meeting. Mr. Sobel approved. Thank you, Commissioner. Is that a motion? Second. Uh, right, second. Um, session. Hearing none, all in favor? Public? Aye. Right? Aye. Sobo? Aye. Boy? Aye. And I'm an aye. Uh, uh, DAP resolution extending County Declaration of Emergency for 30 days. Go ahead, move. Got a motion by McBride. McBride, second for discussion. Second by McBride. Go ahead. Uh, is is uh, Sheriff on or John on? And maybe just touch on uh, what, we're look, what we're looking at. I'm right here. It's just a continuation of the uh, emergency declaration that we already have in place. This is just a 30 day extension. Um, uh, you know, the governor at the state level, they extended the state declaration by 30 days. If I was a betting man, once that expires, it'll extend it again. Um, so this is just uh, the county mirroring the state as much as possible. So, Sheriff, the declaration by the governor last week when he, when he extended the, the declaration till I think, May 13th or something like that, that was just for that. It was not, not the order to, uh, you know, to stay home and all that stuff. That expires May 4th unless he extends that. That is correct. I know there was some confusion um, by the people, and I tried to combat that as much as possible. People saw the extension of the uh, state, the, the emergency declaration, and they automatically assumed that was the extension of his stay-at-home order, which it is not. It's just simply that state declaration allows him to continue to issue these executive orders, which the stay-at-home order is. It's an executive order, and that's still set to expire on May 4th. Um, and at that time, we may, at that time or prior to that, we might see the governor extend that order or make a modification to it, such as he's done, uh, as we've seen leading up to it. If that clears up any confusion. So the governor said home order is done on, on May 4th? It is set to expire May 4th. Um, I just was reading in Star Tribune and a couple other papers. Uh, everyone's trying to speculate if the governor is going to extend the stay-at-home order or modify it. Um, we'll just have to wait and see. But yes, as of now, it's still set to expire May 4th. Board. I guess I already have a motion on a second drive. Correct. Right. Family guy. Any further any further discussion? Okay, Pat looks and I. I want my side. Aye. Uh show them. Aye. Boy. Aye. And I'm an eye. Thank you. Uh, land and forestry, uh, let's see, yeah, land and forestry business. 
Yeah. So do we want to? Do you want to do the timber auction postponement first? Yeah. Okay. So yeah. So which we have? Okay. So we've had our. Uh, you know, as you know, we have four timber auctions a year, and we have our next scheduled one for May 6th is scheduled to be held in Little Fork. Um, we've sent out our auction listing already to all the registered bidders and interested parties. Yep. I think in light of, you know, whether the stay-at-home order is lifted or not on May 4th, I think we're cutting it too close. So we would like to postpone that May 6th timber auction date to a to a date yet to be determined. We'll come back. I'd like to come back to the board when, you know, things look like they're settling down a little bit and we can kind of, if, if this postponement is approved, we would we would set a new date down the road. Okay. All move to approve, Scoy. Okay, motion by Scoy. I have a second. Second by Wade. Second by Pavlik. Um, have you any? Have you had any comments uh, at all from Rogers on this, uh, Nathan? No, I think a lot of them. I mean, we've had a little bit of comment or correspondence with a few loggers. I think. I mean, they know that it's a real possibility. All the agencies are looking at it. In fact, when we sent our auction listing out, we kind of put a disclaimer or a note on that mailing that this was yeah. likely going to be a probability coming down the road. So, yeah. if, and, and if this is approved, we will uh, we will send notices out in the mail to all the registered bidders and keep them keep them up to date. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Jim. Yeah, Mr. Chair, this is Commissioner McBride. Nathan, if if we have to extend and we get get into a pinch in the later summer, is it possibility you make combined sales and have you know like a double sale at one time or something like that? Or we have yeah, that we have that board motion to do do a a seal bid, which is not not a favorite of the board. Yeah, no, we, we there's other options on the table. Um, you know, eventually, you know, the, the end goal is we want to get that get that timber on the market and get it sold, but. Uh, you know, oh, you know, it's. I guess at this point, it's anybody's guess how long this is going to hold on. But uh, you know, we can, you know, we can look at down the road. Even if things start to loosen up a little bit, maybe there's other venues that we can look at that that allow for a little more social distancing. Typically, we have. You know, there's many of you have been to those auctions. You know, we have 40 plus people in the room. So, so that that's the big concern about needing to postpone this. We don't want that many people in that that small of a space. So any any further questions for Nathan? All right. Um all in favor, Pavlik? Wait, I Bright? Aye. Silva? Aye. Boy? Aye. And I. Uh, boat landings, whether or not uh, change anything with that. Nathan? Yeah, so this is, uh, you know, last Friday the governor, Governor Walls, came out with the, his new executive order and he kind of expanded on some of the activities that were already allowed fishing hunting hiking that type of stuff has always been allowed but he, he kind of expanded the outdoor recreation opportunities to golf and shooting ranges and just put a little more emphasis on folks as long as they practice social distancing and stay close to home and follow the guidelines the uh kind of the mental health benefits of uh folks getting out and doing some of those outdoor recreation opportunities um, as you'll recall, we have six of our Rainy River um, boat landing slash parks closed at the moment. And, uh, it's, you know, in light of recent events, it's it's probably time to at least discuss that situation and what the wishes of the board are. I know I talked to uh, the City of International Falls, and it sounds like this, the City Council last night approved opening their two county boat landings no later than 8 a.m. on this Friday morning. So that what that'll do is it'll give... Right? 
What's that? You mean city boat landing? Right? Yeah, the city, the two city boat landings. It'll give city staff time to kind of remove barricades, get get the get the appropriate work done on those sites so they can be they can be opened up before Friday. Um, looking at what we have, you know, surgeon season is the big thing right now. Um, the cutest landing is the DNR ramp at the Pelham Junction. That one has remained open and, and continues to remain open. So um, some of the some of the comments that we've we've received is, is if we open ours up, we're going to relieve some of the pressure on that one ramp and help spread folks out. But at the end of the day, even if even if this moves forward, people really have to adhere to these guidelines that have been spelled out. I'll stay close to home. Don't be traveling a long distance to come up here and do this stuff and and practice good social distancing. Um, you know, it's, don't congregate at the boat ramps and parking lots and that type of thing. So. Yeah, and the other the other thing I should mention too, in that executive order, the governor has closed all private and public campgrounds and dispersed camping across the state. So that is. That is something else that we will likely be doing is posting all of our our uh, developed campsites to close the to camping. Nathan, we should have signs posted at at Thurwood uh, and and uh, well by Second Bridge there. Um, no for no camping. Nathan, are you recommending? Um, I mean, I I guess that's a decision I'd leave up to the board. I know this one could go either, you know, there's opinions on this one either way. Um, you know, I look at, you know, one of the, it is a valid point. I mean, the, the one DNR ramp at the junction is open, and it's going to receive a lot of pressure if ours remains closed. I don't, you know, if I could, for sure, in my mind, you know, if we're, if we're following the state guidelines, you know, they, they had refused to uh, close their landings. Uh, we've had them close for, the, you know, at least by, that, by the actions we've already taken, we've avoided that huge uh, rush for the spring fishing. But, you know, we, I am sure we'll still get a lot of people there if we open them, I guess. Uh, but if, they, if we're going to follow the state guidelines, I mean, it would uh, seem to me they should be open. that a motion? Yeah, so I'll uh, move for a discussion, Mr. Chair. Second, Mr. Chair. Second. 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 I guess if we have a big rush up here and crowded uh, facilities, uh, we're going to have to uh, uh, look at this again uh, next week, or we can look at it again anytime. Uh, that would be my thought. Mr. Chair, Commissioner McBride here. Uh, go ahead. Yes, uh, and what Nathan said about the camping, you know, if, if we get the signs about no camping, that's, that's going to, you know, stop a lot of people coming from way out of town to, to, to do that stuff. Uh, and also my question for Nathan, would, how long would it take, um, you know, your people in highway to, to get the ramps open and, and ready for, uh, you know, business. And also the last thing is people have to, have to, you know, the governor's guidelines says a boat, you need to be six feet apart, only families in a boat. You know, I, you know, I, I can't hardly really believe people are going to follow all that, but, and no guiding, it can be no guide services. And I'm sure the DNR will be looking at some of these issues, but people need to adhere to the governor's uh, orders. And you know, if they do that, we can open and, and have fun and start enjoying Minnesota again. Uh, to answer your question, Commissioner McBride, as far as how long it would take us to get the, these open, I mean, we could we could start working on this right away. The one big thing that you know that we need to get in place our porta potties at these, so a lot of that's going to depend on how soon our our vendor can get those satellite toilets on site. Mr. Chair, this is Yeah, I, I, I think there could be some safe, some safe, some safe fishing stuff, but I really, really 
we'd like to you know, get the word out there that the, that the campgrounds aren't available. Uh, that needs to be advertised and, and reiterated, and, and then maybe we need to have some some guidelines. DNR does have some outdoor guidelines for website um, that we, we can maybe print off and enlarge or something. It just gives you the, basically the same the same uh, a distance. And it also, in the guidelines, says uh, in the executive order that the governor uh, approved, uh, it does say to stay close to home. Now, I, I agree with Commissioner Bright. I don't, you know, some people have a different definition of what close to home is, but um, uh, it's, it's fishing season, too. So if, if, if it can be done responsibly um, and with, within the, the safety guidelines, um, you know, I guess uh, that might be a consideration. Mr. Chair, this is Commissioner Smoy. Go ahead. Go ahead, Commissioner. Oh, I've, I've, got, I've had a fair number of phone calls coming in on this. I have talked to the Sheriff's Department, and, uh, and the Sheriff said that they would increase patrols out there and watch for that. And I, I have my uh, thoughts on this, too, and maybe we should wait, but... Um, I, the governor is opening it. I'm hoping that it's not gonna it's not gonna be a big mad rush. I guess if it is, um, I think through this um, emergency order that the uh, sheriff could shut it down. So maybe we should uh, see what happens, and hopefully people will be respectful and responsible. Ah. I'm afraid this is one of those decisions, guys, that no matter what we do, we're going to get feedback. Good evening, gentlemen. 
I have moved some steam on Facebook with anglers frustrated about the public water accesses being closed to any river due to concerns about the spread of COVID-19. I understand that many anglers are itching to get out on the water and would love to bring their tourism dollars up here. Up there. But I also understand the side of the locals in the area up there. I am not emailing you imploring you to open the access. I am asking that you do what is best for your constituents. If opening up the accesses is best for your local economy, then by all means do that. If keeping them closed is best for public health, I have already canceled my trip up there because my wife works at a hospital in the Twin Cities. And I do not think it would be responsible of me to come up there in case I was an asymptomatic carrier of the virus, and then spread it up there. Even stopping at gas stations, paying for my lodging, and launching my boat could be potentially harmful if I was contagious. I know my opinion may be in the minority, but I am willing to forego one year of surgeon system for the best interest of the residents of Poutine and Lake Lewis County. I will gladly bring my tourism dollars up there next year when this when things settles down.
also, but on the, those other ones on that open water, um, that um, that has expired. So the state accesses are all open in Lake of the Woods County. I don't know about the accesses that the city of Bedette has, though. Um, I could, uh, they didn't have an answer for me on that. Oh, with that, Mr. Chair, I, I would ask, ask for the board chair to call the question. Okay. Uh, uh, Chairman? Yes? This is Darren Kittleson, uh, local game warden. Um, I just wanted to say, or if anybody has any questions for me in regards to what we're looking at as far as the state, I guess I'd just like to, you know, commend you guys for the commissioners for closing the ramps initially during the walleye season, and I know it's a, you're in a tough position right now in regards to the sturgeon season that's coming up. So um, if you have any questions for me or anybody has any questions for me, I can certainly help out or anything like that. So I just want to put that out there. Mr. Chair, Mr. McBride here, Commissioner. Yeah. Darren, uh, with the governor's order, and obviously the DNR will be out, uh, they're not really enforceable. Their guidelines are they not? You know, as far as two people to a boat, and they must be family and, and that type of thing. Yep, you're exactly right. That's the tough part. There isn't really any teeth into it. It's kind of Minnesota nice type thing. Um, please adhere to them, and um, for the public health and, and safety of just not the communities and everybody else. And and I know he's you know really strongly pushing for staying it within your communities, but. Also, you know, we got to think of it as a community. Does it do any good to have 40 to 50 local people from the community here at one boat ramp and, you know, not practicing that social distancing? So, you know, for the public to also keep in that mind, it's just not people coming from outside the area. That's important, too, but also for the local community, too, to adhere to some of those social distancing guidelines. Mr. Chair, may I ask a question, please? Yep. Hey, Darren, uh, do they, is the, I should know this, but are the sturgeon, is that a lottery, is that a lottery tag, or can you just go buy one, or? Um, you can, right now, it's a catch and release season, so anybody during the season that it's open can catch and release. There's no, all you need is a fishing license. The, the keep season starts on the 24th, uh, this Friday, and it goes until the 7th of May, and that's the keep season. So that's just a tag that anybody can purchase over the counter. And then the catch and release season extends to the, from the 8th to the 14th. Thank you. Okay, yep. um, yeah, do we have, I don't uh, know. Uh, Chairman, this is Darren again. I, if, if Perrin's on, I just wanted to let him know too that there's a concern out there of, you know, you know, not allowing the camping, which is a great thing. Um, but there's already been some areas of local businesses that possibly might be um, providing an area for people to camp, which. Obviously, that is a concern, I think, of the county, the state, and everybody in regards to that to at least educate the public that just because the, the county campsites, the state campsites, the dispersed camping, it's still recommended that we don't do any camping. And uh, so I'd advise any type of business that's allowing or charging, they might not be in the business of allowing camping on their site, but parking lots and stuff like that, that, you know, there's kind of that gray area, and, I, and I've been seeing that some right already. Okay, thank you, Darren. Anybody else have anything? All right, all, all the questions, there. Uh, yeah. I would like the verbiage of this motion, Red. Uh, Jim? Uh, what exactly is this motion saying? I would like it read because we've bounced around a lot of subjects here. 
way or the opposite. You know, just because of I have an idea there's going to be a lot of people from out of town. But, uh, but, but hopefully, hopefully people will do the social distancing and, uh, and, you know, hopefully, you know, most of them won't dress up from the city, you know. Not that we don't want their dollars, but, uh, we don't want, we don't want to put pressure on, on the area for them.
theoretically might help with that issue. Uh, we still have the two cubic yard solid waste coupons, uh, and and the cost of those coupons would be the same per yard as as our red coupons. So, um, just uh, providing that information. Does anybody have any questions? Uh, of of taking of letting uh, people come in to get rid of their garbage. Uh, could you say that again, Kevin, please? Could you say the hours of allowing people to come in to get rid of their garbage for? So nine, Monday, Wednesday, and Friday, 9 a.m. to noon. And that, and that part of that is to, uh, so we have probably 80 to 150 customers a day in normal times, and this is it's the same now. Um, but what it allows us to do and allows the operators to do is really concentrate on those customers to efficiently run them through our facilities, to be prepared uh, to keep their social distance. You know, when they're working in the facility and, and people can come during an eight hour shift any time, uh, you know, they are doing other things in between serving customers. I mean, they're managing, so, you know, the solid waste streams, they're taking care of recycling, uh, you know, all kinds of different things that they do. And so uh, uh, when a customer comes in uh, during regular business hours, when, you know, not during this COVID-19 situation, um, uh, they may, you know, put put aside whatever they're doing and, and then go serve that customer. But under this situation, we want to make sure that they are prepared uh, to serve the public in a safe way by keeping their social distancing. People go out there and, and just get out of their vehicles and start having conversations and get close to the operators. And and uh, by really defining the timelines, we really are able to control that traffic and, and, and really limit uh, the contact, keep our social distance and, and – uh, uh, manage the waste stream yeah. efficiently, and and so that's the idea behind that. Yeah. Uh, having the the shorter time frame that uh, that people are able to come out there, uh, don't you have a concern that that would put more people uh, close together? No, so uh, and that's an excellent question, and I've I've received that from other people when we explain it to them that during that uh, that three hour period that we're open, uh, we're managing the traffic uh, that enters the transfer station at the gate. We have an operator there, uh, like I said, uh, 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 you know, dealing with the the uh, the tickets and also managing how how many people enter the facility, so that the operators that actually have to manage the waste uh, can direct those people and keep their social distance and it really helps in the control of that uh, if we're just open at any time where people can come at any time it creates uh, uh, potential for for interaction that might put us put the public and and our operators more at risk Matt, are you still acting as greeter in chief? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I think that uh, there are others that have taken a turn at that, uh, 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 but I, I have been out on the at the gate, uh, 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 assisting customers and controlling uh, flow into the transfer station. But uh, I know Wayne has done a, a great job, also Wayne Fuller. Well, you've done a great job out there yourself, and, and uh, you know. It's, uh, having an initial contact is a good way uh, to educate people to uh, on what we're doing and the explanation Jesus provided us. So thank you, Matt. Thank you. I'm Mr. Any questions for Matt? Mr. Any. Say, yeah. Matt, you know, uh, obviously we, we've seen some some emails and, and uh, some phone calls of people, you know, expressing their opinions and, you know, seeing what other counties are doing. And, and my my response to them is, you know, we will manage our our crews, our people, uh, in a safe matter, you know, manner is, which is best for us. Uh, but the other issue is, they say, well, how long are we going to do this? You know, and I don't know. Do you have an idea at what point you could maybe start expanding the hours uh, as the governor releases something May fourth, or you know, once they say start start moving around a bit? Do you, do you have any idea at all? So, um, and that's an excellent question and a very difficult question to try to answer, of course. 
uh, you know, during these times, I mean, who would have ever thought that we'd have this situation occur? Uh, and, and so it's hard for us to predict what the future holds. We didn't predict that this would happen, and I, I don't know if I could predict when normal, you know, our normal behaviors will, you know, our behaviors will go back to normal. Uh, uh, so hard to predict, but I guess I think that we have to just take, uh, uh, you know, the lead from the, the governor and the state and, and hear what they're saying as far as the stay-at-home home orders and their, their worries about the spread of this pandemic uh, uh, and, and then make adjustments as we hear that information. Any other questions for Matt? Uh, Mr. Chair, if I may? Yep. Say, hey, Matt, thank you, yes. And I, and I, I do agree with, with a couple of, the, couple of things. I, I agree with the red tickets, and I think, you know, to encourage people to bring larger loads is, is necessary, and, and, and that is uh, the right thing to do, and encourage people to, to not be there as often, I guess. The one, the one concern I think I have, um, and I think the public will have here shortly, uh, is, is uh, the hours. Uh, now, that, that doesn't mean to say we have to go back to a regular schedule or anything like that, but I think it's very difficult for people to get, to get there uh, between 9 and noon during the week. Um, you know, lots of people, you know, are, are working and things like that. They just can't, they can't get that into their schedule at 9 to noon. Um, and just, you know, I, even if it were modified or adjusted slightly to accommodate, you know, some people for, you know, afternoons, one day a week or something, I guess would be a consideration with a, kind of a phase in, phase in uh, more towards the, the uh, end of the order, perhaps. Um, I, I'm, I guess I'm concerned that, you know, with spring and with nice weather, um, I think people are going to be wanting to be there. And I think it's impossible for some people to get there, uh, myself included. So um, just, just throwing that out there. Yeah, it, it, you know, we, we're we um, sensitive to serving the public. I certainly have that sense, you know, I have that sense to want to serve the public. I d definitely don't take it lightly to decrease the number of hours that were open to the public. Uh, but because of the situation that we're in, uh, obviously we've made some adjustments uh, to that. And I would love to just go right back to normal hours. Um, our operators are working from 6 a.m., to two, uh, so I'm just giving you a sense right now. The regular hours right now is are 6 a.m. to two, uh, and and they're working. Uh, you know, in the mornings uh, they're handling commercial waste. Uh, you know, basically from six to eight, and then uh, the Monday, Wednesday, and Fridays, nine nine a.m. to twelve, they're handling that that uh, uh, you know open to the, the public waste, obviously, uh, and. And during the times that, that it's not open to the public, they're managing all the other waste streams. We have a decrease of, of uh, assistance out at the, tra at the transfer station because of ODC uh, not providing crews, because of sense to serve not having crews out there. Uh, and so th they have to step up and, and, and provide those services. Uh, that doesn't go away. We need to process that waste. And, and without that help, uh, it certainly has put more pressure on the operators out there. and. And they're doing a great job of trying to, you know, maintain that facility at a high level. Uh, and, 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 you know, of course, we'd expect that. We want that to happen. But uh, so that's the challenge. You know, when we uh, if the regular hours are six to two uh, and the, the reason we did that uh, is because of the, in the early mornings, we're dealing with some commercial waste. Uh, uh, you know, we're trying to. Uh, you know, manage that waste in an efficient manner that uh, keeps people safe. And I, I'm open to anything, I guess, but that's what's happening. Uh, you said you said you don't have reserve crews out there. No, we don't have ODC crews. They've they've uh, they've completely uh, uh, not been able to get out there because of the COVID-19 situation. Uh, and then, of course, since the serve, uh, you know, there's no crews available. I think the state has informed Keith that uh, until, you know, further notice, there won't be that uh, moving forward. And so we don't have those crews helping us. Who's doing the recycling trailer? Uh, Keith himself is running around, and then Wayne has filled in. Uh, Wayne is also taking care of, like, scrap metal and those types of things. Uh, uh, 
And then inside the facility, our operators are handling all of the recycling. So Keith is taking care of the, the, the table trailers by himself. Yeah, he's picking up the trailers, and then Wayne will fill in as necessary. So he'll haul the trailers in, and then the operator. So in, the, in like a ODC and sends the serve would sort uh, recycling, would manage some of that that waste to get them in the proper locations. And right now, our operators are doing all of that. So. Okay, thank you. Any further questions for Matt? Thank you.